thanks. Uh, thanks, Malin. That, uh, that really strikes home, and in part because that's what we're here to do today, to have as much transparency and understanding and clarity as we can about science. You're not going to hear any fake news here. Okay, I mean, I'm, I'm serious about that. So the scientists, the, the families may not be used to hearing about all this, but I can guarantee you people will talk about what they know. They will tell you about the facts. Some of those may not be easy to understand, but they're gonna tell you of what they're confident in. They'll also be required to say, and our hope, our speculation, our desire, may be this and that. But I want it to be clear to everybody where your bill is and how it's being written, okay? And we assembled the, an outstanding team of scientists to present today on a vast variety of different kinds of disorders. Um, and my, my hope is that you come away with this inspired, satisfied, with some of your questions answered, but there's always more questions and that's what science is. That's why it's research, because we don't have all the answers. We gotta find them. That's what we're trying to do here. And uh, part of the reason that we can even have this uh, meeting today is because of the generosity of our sponsors. Uh, please take a look in your book and see them. Retrofen especially has been uh, very key in promoting both the family aspects and the scientific aspects of our get together today. So with that, I'd like to move on and introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Leroy Hood, better, better known to most of us in the business as Lee Hood. And why do we know him? Well, everything that's part of the revolution that you see today in genomics and proteomics, and even if you don't know those words, that's the biological revolution. It was enabled because Lee Hood had uh, developed the DNA sequencer, the protein sequencer. That's really key in all of the things that we've developed over this time. So he is, has founded 15 biotechnology companies and he's a member of very uh, important organizations, including the uh, National Academy of Sciences, which all of us aspire to, the National Academy of Engineering, and the Institute of Medicine. Now, you add all those together and there's 6,000 people in that, but you know what? There's only 15 people who are a member of all three and leaves one of them. In, 19, or in uh, 2013, he received the National Medal of Science from President Obama and he has been uh, listed as one of the 50 most influential scientists in the world. And he's in the top six of their selection for the 100 biotech visionaries of the world. And we are enormously pleased and grateful to have Lee Hood come and talk to us today. And his, the title of his talk is 21st Century Medicine Catalyzing a transform transformation in healthcare, something we all care about. Lee? Um, <clears throat> I'm going to tell you that wellness is incredibly important for all the things you're interested in. Wellness not only optimizes individual health, but it's really the key to understanding complex diseases. And I'm going to tell you uh, exactly why that's true. Um, I started at Caltech as a young assistant professor in 1970 and was really impressed with how complicated biology and uh, the study of disease was. And what was absolutely clear is we, A, didn't have any way to speak about this uh, complexity, and that later became systems biology. But B, it was absolutely clear that we needed all sorts of new technologies. And, uh, this parable of the 
elephant and the six blind men is apt. So each feels a different part of the elephant and declares it's a rope or a fan or a trunk. And of course, that's true, but even if you integrated together all of those six observations, you wouldn't even come close to being able to describe the elephant. And that was exactly the state of the art back in the early 70s when biology did things one gene and one protein at a time, and they had no idea about the systems and their complications and all of these kind of things. So I got interested in saying, if you want to take on a complex object like an elephant, what you really need to do is create an enormous number of new kinds of measurements that let us explore elephant data space in a way it's never been explored before. And I got actually involved in a series of paradigm changes over the years that really dealt with complexity, but I'm just going to run through them quickly because they set the framework for how I think about wellness and how it's really going to transform our understanding of disease. So in my early years at Caltech, we developed uh, four instruments, and then we did uh, several additional ones after I moved to the University of Washington and, and started the Institute for Systems Biology. And, and what those instruments did that was really important is for the first time, you could make high throughput measurements in biology. And that led to the accumulation of data as in the genome project and to big data and its uh, analytics. The automated sequencer got me invited to the first meeting ever held on the Human Genome Project in the uh, spring of 1985 at Santa Cruz. Twelve of us were invited to come and pass judgment on whether it was good or a bad thing. And, and what was absolutely fascinating was it turned out that we were split six to six on whether the Genome Project was good or bad. And those against it were against it because they were convinced that big science is going to destroy small science. In fact, that isn't true at all. It's been enormously complimentary for uh, small science. But what, what is really interesting in thinking about paradigm changes is, and it's true for all of us, you hear what you want to hear. You don't hear what the person says. And I had the feeling the first five or six years going into the community and pushing the genome project where 80% opposed it. And the institute that really opposed it was NIH. They were absolutely against it. And of course, that turned around later when a national academy uh, made a decision that it should go forward and everything. And what was key about the genome project was for the first time, it gave us access to the variability that's present in the human genome and to our ability to correlate that with wellness phenotypes or with disease phenotypes. So we can really begin to understand genetics in a brand new way. And it's, we're just getting to the point where this is uh, starting to take off at this point in time. The automated sequencer also convinced me about a third paradigm change, and that was I became convinced that if you were to practice the kind of biology I was interested in, you really needed to do it in a cross-disciplinary environment. You needed all the flavors of scientists. You needed them to work together in teams. You needed them to understand one another's languages and so forth. So uh, Bill Gates made it possible in uh, 1992 for me to move to the University of Washington set up the first such cross-disciplinary department. And in the eight years of its existence, it was spectacular. It did a whole series of really intriguing kinds of things. But what was then clear was I wanted to build on top of that cross-disciplinary department systems biology. But um, bureaucracies are really complicated things. And, and bureaucracies are honed by the past 
they usually constrain you just barely to being able to exist in the present and certainly to think very far ahead. That is really, really difficult. So in uh, 2000, I resigned from the University of Washington to start the Institute of Systems Biology, the first step across the first Systems Biology Institute, and we immediately began to focus on systems biology. And, and what we did was we began formulating concepts which are really the heart of what this 21st century medicine is today. The systems approach to disease, we call it systems medicine. Uh, I became convinced that healthcare should be predictive, preventive, personalized, and participatory. And you all certainly embrace the participatory part of it. It is absolutely uh, essential. And then later, uh, we developed this concept of scientific wellness, which I'll talk about uh, in just uh, a few moments. In 2014, uh, a colleague of mine and I put together the first pilot project on scientific wellness. And what was really interesting is I went uh, to NIH and I talked with Francis Collins and I said, look, wellness is going to be transformational in a lot of ways. And he just categorically said, wellness is not our interest at all. We're only interested in disease. And I tried to argue with him as I'll <coughs> present the arguments to you that wellness is really don't understand well, but you're not really going to understand some of the key things. We'll talk about what I mean by that. In 2016, the CEO of Providence St. Joseph's Health came to me and said he'd like my institute to be the research arm and me the chief science officer. And this provided an unparalleled opportunity to bring P4 medicine and scientific wellness and systems medicine right into the contemporary healthcare system. We'll talk a little bit about that uh, toward, toward the end of my talk. But let's talk now about what I mean by 20th century medicine and what I mean by 21st century medicine. And I'll tell you, almost everyone out there is practicing 20th century medicine. And, and what do I mean by that? I think in the last hundred years there have been two major paradigm changes in healthcare. So one was a report called the Flexner Report in 1910, where uh, Flexner actually surveyed 155 trade schools and wrote a scathing report saying the trade schools should be cut back and science should be used to deliver healthcare to patients and science should be used to uh, teach medical students. And of course, Hopkins really took that and ran with it. And in doing so, it used the 19th century uh, technologies that were available. And they're listed there, physics and pathology and physiology and chemistry and so forth. But the, the really important point about 20th century medicine is it's all about disease. It doesn't care about anything but finding disease and fixing disease. And 21st century medicine is what I've talked about already. It brings together systems medicine and P4 health care and um, scientific wellness. It uses all the modern kinds of technologies that we've really talked about. But what is really important, it uses systems thinking to solve complex problems, and that's what uniquely distinguishes it from 20th century medicine. So it's all about prediction, prevention, and personalization. Those are the key bywords of uh, 21st century medicine. And we want to understand wellness, we want to understand disease, but the key to understanding the disease is understanding the transitions that go wellness to disease. And we'll talk about that uh, a little bit later on. So uh, systems medicine, uh, 
uh, systems biology brought three really important things to systems medicine. So one is the idea that humans are incredibly complicated. And if you go to a doctor, you're lucky if that doctor makes 25 observations and or assessments. And that doesn't begin to be enough to deal with the enormous dimensionality of the individual. Um, there is really a terrific book called The End of Average by uh, Todd Rose, who basically said, you never, ever want to deal in populations. You want to deal in individual units of activity and in medicine. That's really absolutely true. But it's true in education, it's true in industry, it's true in a whole series of things. His hypotheses are, are absolutely uh, fascinating. So what we did was to uh, kind of invent the large personal databases uh, a year before uh, precision medicine evolved with uh, Obama and so forth. And what that gave us the ability to do was to generate literally billions of data points for each individual. And we could integrate and assess those so that they led to actionable possibilities if acted upon that could either improve wellness and or avoid or ameliorate disease. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. <coughs> and these data clouds are ideal for studying wellness and disease. And it's exactly what the essence of precision medicine should be, but isn't at this point in time. A second contribution is the idea of biological networks. They're kind of the they're the information conduits in living organisms that govern development, physiologic responses, aging, and if they become disease perturbed, they cause disease. And we can now study, and I'll show you in just a minute where we've done that, how disease perturbed networks explain the basic pathophysiology of disease and begin to give us new insights in where we have to go to get biomarkers and drug targets and things like that. Uh, the third area that we've pushed is this idea that there are a lot of transformational technologies and we're not really going to talk about any of these, but I will say one of my favorites is single cell analysis. And I'll just tell you unequivocally, that is absolutely going to transform the world of complexity in ways we never, ever thought about before. Whether it's cancer, whether it's uh, biology, uh, single cell analyses, it's, it's, it lets you get to the essence of the functional unit of information. Strategies uh, are technologies that are put together with computational platforms so you can get high throughput kinds of things. And I'll talk about several of these uh, platforms very quickly just to give you an idea of the flavor. But one of the big differences, again, between 21st century medicine and 20th century medicine are these transformational opportunities to explore brand new dimensions of patient data space that have never been uh, explored before. So one of the first experiments we did in disease uh, back in uh, 2009 was to use prions that had been activated to inject into the brains of mice to trigger a neurodegenerative <laughs> disease that lasted about uh, 22 weeks or so before the, the animals had to be terminated. And, and what we did was to compare the brain transcriptomes of the diseased animals and subtract from them the normal animals to see what things changed. And we were absolutely horrified to see about a third of the mouse genes changed in this process. And what we quickly understood is almost all of that is biologically noise. And 
we devised a whole series of techniques where we got rid of it. And we ended up identifying about 300 differentially expressed, uh, expressed genes that were what we thought the, the real heart of this neurodegenerative process. What we also did was to do a serial histopathology of the, the mice uh, brains. And we saw that there were four major processes that sequentially became activated across the uh, time period. So prion replication and accumulation, that's the first really unique uh, feature of this infection. Microglial activation is really an immune response and then synaptic and nerve cell degeneration are pretty classical things for uh, the killing of nerve cells and so forth. And what we were able to do is show that those four major networks employed about 200 of the 300 genes that we identified and that they were in an incredibly activated in this sequential manner from beginning to end. And the point I'm going to make that's really key for dealing with disease is if you want to deal with disease effectively, you have to look at the earliest transition before things really become complicated. Because as we followed the networks uh, and time passed to, to 22 weeks, we saw things got terribly, terribly uh, complicated and so forth. And uh, one of the things we did was we were able to show that the brain had, had messenger RNA molecules that were specific to the brain that made proteins that we could identify in the blood. And we were able to use some of those brain-specific blood proteins to show actually this whole sequential process not in the brain, but from the blood. So you can actually use these kinds of things as a proxy uh, for what is happening. And, and this is what we really want disease to look like in the future. We want to know what is the event that initiates it and come to understand it and deal with it. We want to capture it before the networks become uh, perturbed and complex and so forth. And, and the wellness to disease transition is absolutely a key point in beginning that, and we'll come back to that a little bit later. One final thing I'll tell you about is we've used mass spectrometry and a whole series of systems-driven filters to be able to, for example, take 400 blood proteins and reduce them down to just two or three that have the ability to detect a cancer nodule or a, a, a non-cancer nodule in the lung. There are roughly three million cases where we see nodules, 600,000 go to surgery, more than half of them are done on benign nodules. So what we set out to do was to get a biomarker that could distinguish the benign from the uh, the, the neoplastic nodules, and we succeeded in doing that. We, we took it from almost 400 proteins down to two, and those 200 proteins actually will allow you to save so many surgeries that it's going to be a four to five billion savings, cost savings, for the healthcare system in the future. We've done exactly the same thing for preterm birth, and if anything, that's a much more severe uh, long-term consequence and everything. So biomarkers, we really do know how to do. So in, in 2014 or so, it was clear that there was this really interesting convergence of things coming together. Uh, systems biology, uh, scientific wellness, <laughs> digital health, um, big data and its analytics and social networks. and they all allowed us to define P4 healthcare in much more precise detail. And let me make a comparison between P4 and contemporary healthcare. So P4 is proactive. Uh, P4 focuses entirely on the individual and not on populations. P4 has a concern with wellness 
and disease, and not only disease. And P4 uses these personalized data clouds because they are the only way that you can assess the relative contributions of genetics and lifestyle environment. And they give you very powerful tools for doing that. We uh, were quite skeptical about how clinical trials are carried out now, where for a cancer drug, you may have 20,000 patients and give them a drug or a placebo and you extract the information. But <coughs> the critical assumption in that study is that all the individuals are identical to one another. And they aren't identical genetically, nor are they identical lifestyle or environment. So it, it's flawed at the very beginning. So what P4 medicine does is take, say, 20,000 individuals and for each generate the data cloud. And then you can classify those individuals according to interesting questions like responder or non-responder to a drug. <coughs> Maybe a key question in clinical trials. And I'm going to talk about that in just a second, so I won't go into that in more detail. But I, I think clinical trials are absolutely going to undergo a revolution. I, I was uh, in Fort Lauderdale uh, two days ago talking to the top 200 people who work about this kind of thing. And I'll tell you, they're skeptical, but there are some people who really do get it. And I think we get to see uh, times are going to change. The social networks are really key. That gets the individuals engaged. It uh, gives us the ability to educate people. It gives us the ability to use advocacy to help our own initiatives. And you, you all do that, I'm sure, absolutely in spades. But the next slide is really a shocking slide. So this is a slide that shows the top 10 selling drugs in the US today. The orange person is the responder. The blue are the non-responders. So it means, in the best case, one in four responds. In the worst case, one in 25 responds. So you spend an enormous amount of money and morbidity and all of these kinds of things. And when you get done with your classic clinical trials with a <clears throat> average population, you have no idea about biomarkers that will distinguish the responders from the non-responders. Whereas if you do it as through these data clouds, you automatically get that as a given right at the very beginning. So I would argue that healthcare really has two major thrusts. One is wellness and the other is uh, disease. And I'll, I'll argue that I think wellness is going to become a major sector of the healthcare economy. And I would guess in a 10 to 15 year period, it could well far exceed in market cap the old disease-based industry. As society readjusts its 96% uh, healthcare dollars spent on disease, to a much more balanced proportion, proportion uh, spent on wellness. So um, uh, we'll see how that goes. In 2014, this statistic was really striking to me, that is, of kids born in this calendar year, 50% are going to live to be 100. And the really key question is, what's the quality of their life for the last 20 to 30 years? And I'll guarantee you, with 20th century medicine, it's not going to change fundamentally. Because you're not dealing with complexity with these systems approaches, and you're not acknowledging wellness, which is really going to be a critical part of things. I persuaded 108 of my friends in 2014 to subject themselves to uh, uh, three uh, Every three months, the uh, blood draws and led to uh, uh, three sets of data that we generated on these people, uh, a 108-person uh, wellness project. 
And this is what I tried very hard to get Francis Collins to find. He said uh, it was uh, totally inappropriate. One of the really interesting questions, and there have been a number of studies on this, is you can ask yourself, what are the important determinants of health? And it turns out that there are really three. Genetics is 30%, environmental lifestyle is 60%, and healthcare is 10%. So we're going to use these personal deaths, dynamic data clouds to look at the genetics and the behavior uh, and environment, obviously, in these studies. So what we did with 108 people was to determine their complete genome sequence. We took blood draws every three months that let us quantify proteins and clinical chemistries and uh, metabolites. We took fecal samples every three months so we could quantify the ratio of species uh, that are present in, in the gut microbiome. And then we used uh, a Fitbit and other devices to get classic uh, digital kinds of things. And when you put all of these together for an individual, as I said earlier, we went to the literature and when we started this study, we had about two or 300 actionable possibilities that we knew about. But as time has passed, and we've gathered more data, the number of actionable possibilities has increased. And as we integrate together different kinds of data, we can deal with uh, the actionable possibilities in very different ways. Well, what's utterly critical in dealing with the actionable possibilities was to have a wellness coach that had two capacities. She was a psychologist, so she sat down with each of the pioneers, and she made them tell her what their health objectives were. And most people have a vaguest idea what that is. And second, she could explain the actionable possibilities in terms of what they were. And <coughs> what was, I think the, the uh, coaches are really critical we got 70% compliance on the actionable possibilities, which really blew me away. I thought we'd be lucky to get 10% or so. And so the coaches are, are uh, really absolutely critical. And they're also critical because they've encouraged the pioneers, as we call them, to enroll again and again and to create longitudinal studies that are incredibly informative for wellness to disease transition. We'll talk about that uh, in just a second. <coughs> what was really interesting is in the first clinical chemistry that we looked at, <clears throat> everybody had major complications. Everybody had multiple actionable possibilities. No one was actually anywhere near as well as they really thought. For example, 53 out of 108 were pre-diabetic. And we moved uh, eight to normal, and many of the rest towards uh, normal at that time. And it's continued to get better as we, we did something that I'll talk about in just a moment. But uh, the, the nutrient abnormalities are really interesting because a lot of these are caused by enzyme deficiencies in your gene. And those are things you can absolutely correct. And, and in some cases, they really do make a big difference. I think everybody came to realize that they weren't nearly as well as they thought. And if you had this grand staircase of wellness, I think most people started uh, toward the bottom. And of course, these actionable possibilities that increase exponentially let you walk up this uh, staircase. And, and what we really want to do is push people to be, uh, to mimic Eric Topol's Welderly, these are individuals in their uh, 80s or 90s that have never been sick, never been in a hospital, never taken a drug. They go into their 90s mentally alert, physically capable, and so forth. And we think with scientific wellness, we can push people into that Welderly thing. But it means that people are going to have to do it, uh, take this on as a lifetime journey. 
And some people are willing to do that, and other people uh, are not willing to do that. Because so many people wanted to continue after the Pioneer study was over, we started a company called Aravail that brings scientific wellness to uh, consumers. <coughs> and <coughs> I'm not going to talk about that, but I, we really hope to have about 20,000 individuals within the next three years. And you'll see why that's really going to be exciting. And Here's a list as of about six or seven, eight months ago of wellness to disease transitions that we've already seen. And just let me give you one example. For cancer, we've seen 319 wellness to disease transitions. And that's really important because we can get biomarkers that can do early diagnostics, and I'll show you just exactly what that is all about. So, um, novel discoveries from the 108 Wellness Person Project. We, we published a paper in Nature Biotechnology last year that summarized these studies, and, and the results really are quite striking. So there were three observations, and each of these observations is really going to change how we think about biomarkers, how we think about drugs, how we think about mechanisms of disease. One is multidimensional statistical correlations. I'll show you what that means in a moment. The other is we can estimate your genetic risk for actually now probably roughly 127 different diseases that have been measured by genome-wide variation association studies and so forth. And then finally, we're beginning to see these state transitions, wellness to disease and vice versa and so forth. So we'll, we'll talk about those. <coughs> Here's the, <coughs> the wheel of uh, 3,500 statistical correlations with data bit in one type with data bits and the other five types of uh, data. And in fact, if you put that into a hairball, it looks absolutely undigestible and you don't know what you're looking at. But what we did that worked really beautifully is we cut the edges that had the lowest statistical probabilities and we kept cutting them until we brought into uh, focus more than 70 communities. And those communities corresponded to physiology, to disease, to biomarkers, to a whole variety of different kinds of things. And in fact, an example of one of the uh, communities is this one you'll see expanding out here. So this is LDL cholesterol. And you can see that it's positively associated with vitamin E. It's negatively associated with endogenous thyroxine. And there is a drug, actually, uh, a thyroxine drug, that actually is used to reduce LDL levels and so forth. We've actually looked at a whole series of these communities. In nine other cases, we've found things that looked interesting. <coughs> Pharma is making drugs on today. And we probably have two or 300 candidates that really are interesting for someone to come and look at it in the future. So the correlations are, are entirely unsupervised. They just give you associations that give you insights into relationships we've never had before. So, uh, we can do the polygenic risk on all these different diseases using the uh, GWAS data. And uh, you can see here in these examples that there were hundreds of thousands of individuals that were analyzed, in some cases to get uh, anywhere between uh, eight and 100 or so uh, variants and so forth. But what you do is you take the variants, you look at the individual's genome, and you map to them the variants that correspond to the uh, variation they have in their own genome. And since these are all done based by log measurements, you can sum up the total 
risk for a given individual. And then what we did was we took 2,000 normal individuals and put them through all of the uh, same kind of genetic risk calculations. And then we can take each of the pioneers and put them on, in this case, high cholesterol levels and see whether it's above average or uh, below average in terms of genetic risk and so forth. Now, why is knowing genetic risk so important? Well, I'll give you a simple example. We can beautifully get the genetic risk for Alzheimer's. It turns out that there are now probably things you can do if you get Alzheimer's at the very earliest stage to reverse it back to normal. So it's absolutely going to be critical in the future for that and for other kinds of uh, chronic uh, diseases. And you can take all of the things that you're at high risk for, and we can look very, very carefully at you to make sure that you have a transition from wellness into a disease state. And if we do, to, to respond to them in an appropriate fashion. And here are just a list of uh, examples of things that uh, GWAS diseases uh, have and everything. Now, there is a, another really, really important point, and this is a little bit subtle, but let me try and explain it to you. And that is, we've took the 108 pioneers that you see here, and we put them in terms of genetic risk for LDL cholesterol. None of these people have heart disease. They're all normal as far as we can tell, okay? What is really incredible is LDL cholesterol increases in a linear fashion as the genetic risk increases. It doesn't come from the disease. It comes from the genetic risk itself. And we know that LDL cholesterol can be brought down with statins and you can actually change you, yourself from very high risk to more moderate risk by uh, appropriate treatment. And for all the diseases we've looked at, we see these kinds of fascinating correlations. And here's, here's one example of uh, inflammatory bowel disease. With increasing genetic risk, there is a striking decrease in the amount of cysteine that's present in the blood. And the reason that's important is cysteine is a key pathway to uh, glutathione, which is absolutely critical in getting rid of oxidative states and stresses. This is one of the key things that really turns on inflammatory bowel disease. So the really interesting question here is can we take people at very high risk and bring their cysteine up to normal and change their risk? So we're going to be testing those kind of ideas in the future. So we can use the data clouds to identify earliest wellness disease transitions and send them off for appropriate therapy. Alzheimer's is a, is a great example. And we can identify analytes that, analytes that correlate with genetic risk. And maybe they'll be drugs or biomarkers or whatever. Okay, and the final point I'm going to make are the disease transitions. So this is a 46-year-old uh, woman that was diagnosed uh, early in 2017 with stage 4 uh, pancreatic cancer. And we had four blood draws before the actual diagnosis was drawn. So we could look at all of those blood draws and what we did was we looked at the roughly a thousand analytes we measured in these data clouds to ask were there outliers for that one particular individual. And what you can see here is there were four outliers way out beyond anything anybody else saw before. And it turns out this protein is a um, growth receptor that makes a lot of sense. It's found in the beta cells of the pancreas. 
And so I think this is absolutely a terrific candidate as a biomarker, but we need to have more studies uh, with stage four pancreatic cancer to confirm these kinds of things. But this is what we can do. If you see transitions, you can go back then and look at each of the thousand or so analytes and say, are any of those outliers compared to what the normal population you're dealing with at that point in time has? So uh, I would say that preventive medicine of the 21st century, Arafel now has uh, 3,500 uh, patients. We've already started to see an enormous number of transitions. And uh, we're already to use the data clouds to get biomarkers to mark the transitions and then use system strategies to get therapies that can reverse the transition before it ever manifests itself as an irreversible phenotype. And, uh, and so thus, this could be really the end of chronic diseases if we succeed on a global state. And we're, we're going to really press first with Alzheimer's, and I can uh, uh, talk about that with some of you afterwards if you're uh, really interested. The applications of these data clouds are really astounding. They let us optimize human wellness. You've heard about that. They let us follow disease and response to therapy and return to health or not. Uh, they let us identify the earliest transitions and think about reversing with therapy those earliest transitions. And the two-step clinical trial I proposed to Merck I, I didn't get an enormously enthusiastic response, but uh, is one, let's start with just 50 patients. <coughs> we'll use the data clouds. <clears throat> and we only want to look at three things. We want to get markers that determine whether you're a responder or not to the drug. We want to be able to stratify that disease into its major types, subtypes. And, and finally, we want to look for off-target toxicities. And if pharma thinks this looks good, then you can do a second trial with 50 patients only. These patients are all responders. So you'll get a 98% response. And Genentech took Herceptin to the FDA with 46 patients and a similar response. So I think, I think this is going to work very well in the future. NF1 experiments are really the key, I think, to understanding nutrition. Nutrition is one of the most complicated things we have to deal with. Um, and we're using NF1 experiments to quantify wellness, resilience, and aging. And I, could, I could talk about what we're doing there. So Providence St. Joseph's is a big system. Uh, 50 hospitals, 5 million patients uh, served a year, 30 million electronic medical records and so forth. We've set up uh, a translational uh, systems medicine center that's going to look at clinical trials. It's going to create a technical platform for doing these data clouds in a far more effective way than we can do it now. And we're setting up scientific uh, uh, wellness clinics uh, based on a clinical trial I'll tell you about in just a moment and we're going to be doing the same for Alzheimer's clinics too. We're, we're bringing education uh, to uh, healthcare professionals in a big way. Uh, we've had a lot of experience in doing that kind of thing. We have the first two of these clinical trials now underway. So one Scientific wellness, a thousand employees of Providence are taking the Aerovale program for three years and they'll be compared with a thousand random employees and over three years we want to prove uh, effectiveness of increased health and wellness and we want to demonstrate an enormous amount of savings that's going to come from these studies. Um, and with Alzheimer's we're actually setting up clinical trials that use this new multimodal 
uh, approach to Alzheimer's. I'll tell you with Alzheimer's, it, Alzheimer's is the most grim disease I know of. So there are 400 clinical trials that have been done in the last year, uh, uh, 12 years, for Alzheimer's. Zero have produced a drug that's relevant. And it's time to do something different. This, you, you, and in fact, Pfizer is getting out of Alzheimer's completely. They just announced that they're going to do it. And what you need is you need this multimodal complexity approach kind of thing, which we're doing. And I think it'll be, I think it'll really be interesting. But the key to these translational pillars is using the data clouds and using the systems-driven technologies that, uh, that we have. So we're bringing P4 medicine to the healthcare system. We're using the data clouds to assess environment, uh, genetics. We're optimizing wellness. We're reversing disease at some of the earliest transitions are starting to anyway. Um, we, we are utterly convinced that the reduction in healthcare costs is really going to be dramatic. And we, we can talk about that if you wish. Scientific wellness is a lifetime journey, as I said earlier. And the scientific wellness industry is going to be a major opportunity. That's, I think, one of the biggest challenges for pharma is to figure out how to get into the wellness business. And that's, I think, going to be a real struggle for them. Um, uh, I think with the data that I showed you here, it's really going to transform how the healthcare industry carries out their science in the future. We have correlations and associations and outliers and transitions that we've never seen before. We have a whole new approach to looking at uh, uh, new opportunities. And so, uh, and, and finally, the, the real limitation of scientific wellness at this point in time is the cost of the assays. And I think in a five-year period, they'll come down by 10% or so. So I think we'll be in, in good shape. So getting back to 21st century medicine as opposed to 20th, I think it's only with 21st century medicine that we're going to achieve the three major real objectives that we want to achieve. One, improve the quality for each individual health. Number two, uh, <coughs> initiate prediction and prevention, the analysis of transition points and reversal and all of those things. And three, reduce the ever escalating costs of uh, health care. So, thank you very much. Thanks, Lee. Uh, Lee has agreed to take uh, some questions here for a while, so if there are people, uh, we got microphones, unless you got a really big voice, uh, get on up and uh, please. How do you find out? Because sometimes they know I've been through a little You know, it's hard to hear you back there, so grab the microphone if you could. How do you what? How do you find balance? Use my So we're quite confident that we'll have quantitative blood measures that will define wellness within the next year or two. And we've already done some really interesting things that, that uh, have moved in that direction. So I don't think that's going to be a problem at all. I, th I think we'll have quantitative metrics for wellness. Sure. Sure. Yeah. 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 Absolutely.
I, I absolutely agree. I think one of the most important things we can do are to use these uh, data clouds to study families. And when you study families, you learn all sorts of additional things that you never learn if you just study a sporadic individual because of Mendelian genetics and all the things that you can use. So I think that's really an important point. We've done a number of uh, family studies, and it, it's really quite exciting the kind of things you can do. Right. So, I think uh, scientific wellness for children is a challenge now because of the amount of material you need to get to make all the different kinds of measurements. But we and others are doing microfluidic, highly parallel technologies that I think in five years will bring the cost down to five or ten percent of what they are now. So I think we can I think we can begin to deal with that uh, pretty effectively. Thank you. And last question here. It is working. Uh, thanks very much. That was fantastic. Is it possible to get a copy of this? It was so information dense. Is it possible to get a copy of this presentation? It was so information uh, dense, or? Sure. If you yeah, I think if you sign a release, uh, yeah. I, I think we'll work it out. Fantastic. And the other, the, the question is, uh, with all of this, what do you see specific impacts on potential gene therapies for diseases, and what might they be? I can see some of them, but I'm, you probably got a different idea than I do. Well, I think, I think there are really exciting possibilities with CRISPR and things like that, where we can really deal with defects that are related to single gene uh, complications and everything. So I think that's a very, very exciting area that we should really explore, and especially you should explore, because, I mean, as I understand, m most of the diseases that you're running into are single gene kinds of things. So they're absolutely perfect candidates to really go after repair and everything. So Thank you. I, I push that very hard. Okay. Thanks, Lee. Yeah.